what we're trying to do here is to give the people who are coming in who are interested in how businesses develop, whether they might take the modes they're seeing and use themselves or not, and generally have a chance to talk with people, find out what the headaches were, how they got by them, et cetera. And I'm particularly happy to have you as Martin as a uh, contributor here because your business plan is radically different from most of the business plans that we have uh, heard about so far. And we'll, you know, the way we, we do this is that Jakob will ask you questions and see what happens in terms of answers. The other thing I should mention is we have a major uh, virtual meeting on June 7 through 10 that's happening in three, uh, four different time zones. And we're trying in this to include people from all around the world. And it's an experiment. We don't know if it's going to work well, but we're optimistic. And uh, we'd like everyone to come and, uh, and enjoy it. We have some really good speakers. And I think we're, we're trying something new this time, which is we're having something called Horizon Scans, which is to let people from different parts of the world say what they think is going to happen to cytometry in the next few years. And we also have what we've always had in the past, the technology showcase, where we have people compete to present their new things. So uh, having said all that, Jakob, it's yours. Okay, thank you, Betsy. So hello, I'm, I'm um, Jakob Nedba. I'm a former ISAC Merrill Ingram Scholar. And today I'll be interviewing Martin Thomas of KN Research for the next uh, Innovation Stories. So Innovation Stories is educating about science entrepreneurship, but we do not educate through a standard curriculum, but by sharing the journeys and experiences of successful entrepreneurs in our field. And Martin is our speaker today, and he'll tell us how he founded and developed Cairn into a successful business. Cairn Research provides scientific products and services, enabling single cell analysis by means of imaging, electrophysiology, and microscopy across the globe. Martin is a natural pick for this series because his entrepreneurial approach challenges the traditional teaching and direction set by business schools or incubators or advisors or investors you may have. He and many others have successfully demonstrated that this, this standard approach to scientific entrepreneurship is not the only one. And entrepreneurs can achieve great success and joy from running a scientific business independent of external stakeholders. And so Martin will tell us today how he founded in Berkham Research what important choices he has made in the process, what he has learned. And I hope this insight we will hear today from him could help others in their scientific or entrepreneurial path. So Martin, welcome. And Thank can you. you briefly tell us about your career path that led you towards founding Cairn Research and what was the motivation to start the business in the first place? Uh, yes, it's funny you should ask because I do have an overhead which uh, goes through that. And what we want to do with Jakub is for me to put on particular overheads as and when they become appropriate, rather than for me to work my way through some prepared talk, because there isn't a prepared talk. But this is uh, on, the, on the overheads now, if, if you're seeing that, uh, this is what I call Martin's timeline BC, before Ken. So I was, uh, came into this world at a very early age in 1950, uh, then... Uh, you know, various other things for growing up and so on. I did my undergraduate and PhD degrees at Cambridge in the UK. And yeah, that was, that was cool. I spent, or should perhaps, well, wasted all those perhaps all spent building all sorts of equipment, some of which was for my research, others of which was for fun because of audio and, and, and so on. But I'm one of these people who love doing things. Uh, and then in the late 1970s, I uh, defected to the USA, Boston, for a few years, where I had a very, in retrospect, a really wonderful postdoc, where I was uh, making uh, optical instrumentation and using it to measure calcium changes in, inter in single nerve cells by virtue of using an absorbance-sensitive dye. And this was just before the fluorescent indicators came along. So that, that was really fun. You see, one of the problems that people like me have 
is because we're so interested in the technical side and we can do it, when it comes to uh, getting academic positions, then we do perhaps tend to be a little bit frowned on. You know, your motives aren't perhaps quite the purest uh, there. And to be fair, I had doubts myself as to whether an academic uh, career was going to be sensible for me either. So I tried to square the circle in 1979 I had a, what appeared to be a very interesting job offer from labs owned by Shell Research in Kent, which is where I now am, is where I, where I moved to. And it looked like a great possibility to combine uh, you know, my interests with their capital. However, I was finding instead of my interest, what I could do with, with their money, it was more, it, yeah, much more controlled by what they wanted. And uh, the fact that they had money didn't really help help me because I couldn't do anything useful with it. So there was a bit of soul searching going on there. Should I go back into academia or, or what? But I, then I thought, well, if the halfway house trying to combine research and business isn't going to work, why don't I take a chance and go all the way? The, there was both crazy things and good things going on there because those labs, I don't want to run them down too much. It was a long time ago now but it was very difficult to do anything useful there. So the mind wanders and it left me a lot of time and energy to get going with Ken. There's a product, I'll maybe pick up uh, exactly what the products were that we were designing and, and selling at, at that time for, for another question. But the important point from the entrepreneur point of view was that I started Ken part time. So it didn't need any money. It took me a while to get the thing going because, as you'll see from the uh, the timeline, that I founded Cairn in 1985. In terms of a continuation of things at Shell, there was an interesting opportunity to do some molecular biology work at, at Leicester for a couple of years. So I went to do that while uh, building up Cairn part time, and then when I came back, uh, I could, uh, sadly I, I could see that uh, Shell was not going to be a long term uh, goer for me. So continued to build up Cairn, and we took on our first uh, employee, uh, other than me, because I was still only part-time in 1988. And I didn't make the break until 1989. Now, from a business and the finance point of view, this was vitally important because in 1988 and before, the company was making enough money to employ somewhere else, someone else, whereas I still had my shell salary coming in. And... By the time uh, that person had been with us a, a year or so, then the business had made enough money to start paying me as well. So we've always been cash positive. And I think that's clearly a very important point. By doing things this way, I didn't have to talk to outside investors. I uh, did go to a talk on uh, venture capital around the time I was setting up Ken, and I, I realized that it was hopeless from the point of view of what I wanted to do because nine out of their 10 businesses they funded went broke, so you'd, lost, you'd have lost whatever you'd put in. But the other tenth would then make a lot of money and be sold on under your feet, whether you like it or not, because as well as giving you money, they would uh, take a shareholding and insist on, uh, on doing, taking things out that way. So it's basically, it's fine if you want to get rich quick or slowly, or maybe not get rich at all if things go badly, but it wasn't for me. I wanted something more for the longer haul that I could really get my teeth in. I regard money as fertilizer, if you like, for spreading on fields so you can grow crops and do things, not as a, a means to an end. And uh, as we go on with this talk, I'll talk about crops and so on because we've ended up being on a farm, which is really rather nice. So that's the basic background as to how we got started. And once, you, once you're cash positive, then you stay cash positive if you get things right. And so that's how it's been for us ever since. That's great. So we already have a question from the audience and I would encourage anybody to ask questions as we go along. And so Kathy was asking what was Ken originally funded to do? And that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. What was your first product? Yeah. Oh, right. Who were your first customers? How did you find them? And how did you grow your credibility and attract more people? Yeah, let me move on. There we are. Um, what really uh, revolved around the postdoc that I did, where I was talking about calcium measurement with absorbance indicators. I've got a little prop here 
I could have written a book about my rather frustrating experiences at Shell, but on the front cover, I, while I was there, I managed to uh, get another book, uh, actually about my, my research at the time, which was calcium measurement. And I'm showing this because on the front cover, you can see a burst of action potentials. This was from a marine snail. And above it, there's an optical trace, which is absorbance shifts. Now, journalists of all sorts, be it being the nature they are, on the front cover, without telling me, for artistic reasons, they displaced the optical trace from, from the electrical one. But these little jumps here should be, uh, should be no, they are, increases in, in differential absorbance caused by calcium coming in during individual action potentials in this spot. Can you move it down a bit? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Excellent. There we are. Yeah, and I'm still a bit of a novice on all this AB stuff, for which I apologise. So yes, yeah, this was something which attracted people's attention. Although to be fair, as I say, because I had this reputation for being uh, an equipment builder rather than a, a researcher, that was another thing I was finding. I don't want to get too nationalistic about this, apart from our nice European flag over there. But uh, I did find that you know, people, people like me were, as I possibly said before, viewed a bit askance when it came to being offered jobs, could not, perhaps not sufficiently sound in, in respect of what one's actually doing. Anyway, to get back to the chase, the way I was measuring these differential absorbance changes was one of these things. Let me just see. Yeah. I'm getting, I haven't got multiple views here, I'm just getting ahead of it. Inside here is something that looks like that. It's a small, lightweight wheel with serrations around the edge, and it would be driven by a jet of compressed air. So you could get something like this, spinning at many hundreds of uh, revolutions a second. So you get very fast wavelength changes with your differential absorbance. And that's the thing that sort of, I suppose, made or broken my reputation ever since, because uh, you know, during uh, what I sadly regard as the dark days in Shell, with fluorescence measurements uh, coming on, then there was an interest in being able, because of how the fluorescence indicators work, or some of them, to have fast differential excitation, put in one excitation wavelength, uh, followed by another, and then you, you do ratiometric uh, fluorescence based on that. So as a way of catering for this market initially part-time when I was in Shell, this was the uh, next product we came up with, well, this was just my own use, really. So it's a filter wheel. Instead of being uh, driven by compressed air, it's a rather slower beast, but works with uh, just an electric motor underneath. Then the first commercial product was a slightly tarted up version. That, that's, that's this thing. So it's a filter wheel. This was using half inch or 50 millimeter filters. Because going in on an excitation light path, we just had to get light through. You didn't need to do any imaging or anything. So keep the wheel still relatively small. And this could spin continuously, uh, one or 200 revs a, a second. And then it was a rather crude thing that did work, although you couldn't rapidly step between one filter position and another. You could get the thing to clunk around to whatever filter position you wanted. <laughs> Next version, yeah, this was what we were selling in 1989 and so on when we were just yeah, beginning really full time. And then by the mid nineties, we came up with this version here, which is superficially, it looks rather similar. In fact, we made it look similar just so that it was a drop-in replacement. But this is a more sophisticated type of wheel that could rapidly discontinuously step between individual filter positions. So that, that was a, a very nice extra thing to do. But meanwhile, the, the market was changing a bit. So people didn't want to change wavelengths using filter wheels anymore. So instead, monochromators. So this, there's a company, Till, who, who used to be uh, very noble competitors of ours until yeah, they were bought and then rebuilt, bought, and all of the stuff that they used to do is no more. But we're still here, and we're selling this. Uh, this dates from uh, around the turn of the century, this design. And yeah, we don't sell as many as we used to, but we still sell. It's after 20 years, it's still a, a, a goer. So what we're doing here is... Um, taking yeah, light in from excitation point. It actually, yes, yeah, so the light comes in here. It's shone onto this part here is a, uh, a small diffraction grating. And this, this can be moved around and uh, basically you get a spectrum out the other end. So the important thing 
different product, but it was tuned for the market. So once we produced the monochromator, then you know, we could sell that, sadly, instead of filter wheels, but we still still there. But now the market was changing again because with imaging coming along, where you really want to have things which may be changing wavelengths on an emission side, where instead of using simple photo detectors, as this stuff did in the early days, now people want to have cameras. So you need to have filters in front of cameras and yeah, this type of filter in that side, that's, that's too small. So this was our first attempt. We, we sold one or two, this is rather a fun idea, but didn't work as well as we wanted. So we've got a, a wheel here and we've actually got magnets around the edge and these coils further around the outside. So the thing is driven rather rapidly and positively by, uh, by these, and that allowed us to have three small filters or three one inch filters in a relatively small space. But in general, it's just not a feasible way to go. And a six filter version of this was a, was a nightmare. So that didn't really go anywhere. But we basically, we have a pre version, the version one, version two, version three. Now that gets us to the present day. This is what we call the OptoSpin 4. Uh, this is a, one of our later development prototypes, but I'm showing it here so you can see how it works. We've got a small but very powerful motor it's known as an outrunner that uh, was originally or still is sold a lot for electrically powered model aircraft, which need a high power to weight uh, ratio. So this is, this is handy. And by getting the motor in the uh, center of, of the wheel, you have something with a, a very small profile. That's very handy when you want to connect to things. I've seen an awful lot of filter wheels out there that look compact and fast, but they will then have some, uh, uh, some big motor or, or some, some such coming out the back, which makes them rather harder to, to do. There's also uh, a, a great fun we can do here with, I could not so easily show this, but you can have two wheels, which are kind of interleaved, so you can get two within the same space. Now that took an awful lot of development to get working as well as we wanted, but it, it does, and it did. Now we have, as an alternative, because camera's getting bigger, so we need bigger images to come through, then this is the 32 millimeter version of the wheel. In fact, I'm probably sure as a hybrid, although you wouldn't do this, this is how you can get two wheels within the same overall uh, optical space. So that's a fun thing to do, because you can have six filters in one, one wheel, uh, yeah, six in the other, so you can have two in series at the same time. Or if you leave one position blank in each of two wheels, then you've effectively got a 10 position filter changer, which is much faster dynamically than a single uh, 10 position wheel would, would do. And now just in the last few days, this is an example of me keeping my uh, ears to the ground and seeing a, a possibility someone wants to put something in front of a camera lens rather than just a camera. So the last few days, I've been scale scaling this thing up again. So we're now uh, talking about, in fact, doing a 50 millimeter diameter version, which is going to be quite a beast. Luckily, these electric model airplanes, because the whole family of products there. So this uses a bigger motor than that one, the same family, and the 50 millimeters will be bigger still. It'll be quite a, quite a grunt type of product. Should be great fun. So yes, that's the point. We had a market or at least I had personal connections. I was in this strange position of being much more high re highly regarded by my peers than my, by my then superiors. So, but in business, yeah, to get on in academia, you need to be well regarded by your superiors, but to get on in business, it's the peers, the customers out there. Do they like you? Do they like your stuff? So that's been really cool. And I've been very pleased about that. So do I understand correctly that your first customers, uh, recruited from people in your field that you directly knew, they knew you, so you could yes. directly come to them and offer them what you have developed in your uh, past days. Is that correct? And then when you, you know, to build it, you still needed money. So um, did you ask them for credit prior to delivering it? Or how did you fund that? <laughs> Ah, development and yes, sale and production. Well, first, first ever customer, by the way, was David Eisner. Some of you may know because he's yeah, he's been very successful and done a lot of stuff uh, on the heart. 
and got a high up in the physiological society, being professor at Liverpool for quite a number of years. He actually studied at Oxford, and the, some of the then leading lights uh, around, around then. So yeah, he's, he's been very, very supportive. But lots of other people since, uh, co other colleagues of those have, have come in since then. Now, actually, what was particularly cool, it's another prop here, I don't like to be, be seen. This is a module, this is a rather large one. This is a computer interface. Uh, what I did, because people buying this, they needed electronics as well. So I uh, put together a modular system. I sat down and devised a, a series of connections that would be on a backplane. So all these modules for uh, detecting and then doing things with uh, the detected optical signals, which bearing in mind they were just photosensors rather than uh, imaging at that time. So there was uh, a module for capturing the individual filter positions uh, signals as the as the wheels were rotating normally they would spin but you could also uh, step them discontinuously if you if you wanted to so there was something that did everything all together and then there was another thing we called the output module which demultiplexed so it gave the uh, the latest output for each of the up to six filter positions and then there was other things for modulating gain or adding dc offsets and then doing uh, logarithmic or ratiometric things. And these were all separate modules. What was cool about that was that I uh, developed them one by one. So when I sold the first system to David Eisner, we only had input and output. But all these other things were, came along uh, a bit later on. And that sort of allowed us to uh, basically start. So it's a very important point, this actually. It enabled us to start selling a product when in a certain sense, it was only partially developed. So it had something that people could use right from the start, but as we further developed and made it rather more you know, sophisticated in terms of what we do, then uh, you know, people could keep up. Also, I'm afraid, uh, yeah, again, another very important point here, and I think a lot of people uh, overlook, there's another company we're, we're talking to, they, they do some nice things, and they were saying how, how nice it was that they could sell their products cheaply because they had family friends to, to do a lot of the stuff, so they weren't costing any money. And I was actually said to them, no, that's not the way you want to do it at all. Me being a rather mercenary person in some ways, I, I guess, right from the start, I was pricing our products for what I thought the market would stand, not what it was costing me to, to make and design, because that was effectively being subsidized by Shell and, and, and so on. So this meant that not only could we progressively introduce things, so getting revenue right up front for a basic version, and then supplemented by other people upgrading the basics, and then as the system became more sophisticated, then it uh, became more and more suitable for, shall we say, less technically au fait people to use. So that's been a, a, a particularly important thing. And that allowed us to make for a couple of years based on two and then three of us uh, in the house, that allowed us to uh, you know, basically get our own premises very quickly. So that'll be, we don't necessarily have to go to this next overhead yet, but it's, it's in terms of uh, continuing the, the, the thread that we're putting here, that's another thing that we, we were able to, to do. Windfall profits because of being able to sell things and develop as we go, staying cash positive all the time. I see. So it's a gradual scale of the business as well as the product in yes. reality. Yes. And how did you find your suppliers uh, at that point, or 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 uh, you know, did you did you use someone to produce the things, or everything was uh, homemade? Um, um, I'm afraid I, I don't want to sound too cynical, but I think it still applies sometimes today. It's what I would call the fifty percent rule. Fifty percent mm -hmm. of the people you try and get to do things turn out to be complete rubbish. But the point is, is not that they are rubbish, but the other 50% who seem to be doing much better, okay, then you stick with those. So there's, there's inevitably a certain amount of, if, if you like, weaning or willowing, winnowing going on in, in terms of who you stick with and who you, who you don't. But yes, it, it is a problem. It is a problem to find sometimes the right people to, 
to do things. I'm going through exactly the same thing with uh, a bit of house extension that I want to do uh, with, with the farmhouse here at the moment. Yeah, and I, I got delayed by four months because I, I got hit by the 50% rule. And the first person I asked to do something spent four months to come up with something that wasn't what I asked for. So I'm afraid, uh, although I, hope, I, I like to think I'm a reasonable, decent person, but if people can't do what I want, uh, then I just go elsewhere. Don't get upset about it. Don't get mad, get even, so to speak. But I, nevertheless, I, it sounds like I, I'm a bit brutal towards suppliers. I don't think I am. It's just a, a, a matter of finding people that mm -hmm. you understand you and you can work with. And some people you can and some you can't. But it is very important. You really don't want to get too quickly into bed with people until you know that they can do things. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now we understand how you founded Cairn and how you organically grown it uh, in size. Um, so I guess at that point you had to all, already be developing some, some culture in your company and hold the people together and give them motivation to work uh, towards further growth, right, where you're now. And so how do you how do you do that? And how do you maintain it? I mean, people have been with you for a very long time as far as I am concerned. A or aware. Very challenging question in the sense when it's in the early days, there is a sense of magic and camaraderie, which sadly it can't be maintained indefinitely, but there's bits of it still here. But to give you an idea of how a group of us were, Andrew's on my right is one of the half dozen to 10 people who uh, were with us near the outset and indeed who are still here. We used to be an all male company. Now we're, we're uh, sexually much more uh, equal. Ethnically, I'm afraid, I think we're all white, but that's just a coincidence. Um, but yeah, there was a time when we were all guys and we would go out to pub for lunch. And that, for, for some years, took the place of regular meetings. There was even one case where it worked, we worked out in retrospect, we'd been down the pub five days one week, four days the next. And the reason that we weren't there for the fifth day was it was Good Friday. So sadly, you know, that, that sort of fun dy dynamism days were, were long gone. But it just shows you what you could do uh, when you're all uh, having a bit of fun, enthusiasm, and, and, and so on. Yeah, sadly, it can't go, go on like that. And of course, certainly more people become, shall we say, a bit more conscientious, and that, that's fine. I still tend to be the leading light. At least we have a sort of uh, tradition that Jez Blaise, bless him, he will try and join into if he's not too busy. But at least we try and go out for a pub lunch on Fridays. But it, it is. It is a very difficult thing because some of our people who have been here since the old days, they say, oh, it's not quite the same as it was. And I'm afraid in, in that sense, it can't be, but it can still be fun. And I do my very best in, in various ways, I hope to try and make it continue to be, be fun. So you, you, you told me once that, with, I guess tongue in cheek from you, that Cairn is a lifestyle company. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> yes, in fact, so what do you mean by that? Said by others, but for me, it's a lifestyle company, oh, uh, and I hope it is for others too. But the, the question is, you see, certainly it's obvious for me, but for everyone as well, your job is part of your life, and to feel that you can be uh, yeah, there, uh, at, in a sense, as part of your existence rather than just something that makes you money is, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's cool. Uh, but, but again, you see, we're all in the real world and you know, one has to, to accept that not everyone can feel like that all the time. But uh, one of the things I keep going to say, tell people till I'm almost blue in the face in, in respect of how we, how we operate. Look, we don't have outside investors. We don't have outside shareholders. We don't have a head office to placate. And the practical implications of, of that, I, I think, can be quite hard to take on board. We're you know, a lot freer than perhaps you know, many of us realize. Mm. So one of my many tasks in, in life is to you know, try and uh, instill and remind people that yeah, we can do it. If we want to do it, then we can do it. 
So this leads me to the freedom that you have because you're not tied to a, a head office or investor. Um, leads me to the next question, but just before I go there, there was a quick question coming in. So how many people work for Care Now? Can you tell us? Oh, about half or, of them. No, I mean, what's the number of people? Sorry, sorry that's my standard joke. When people say no. how many people work here, I would say about half. Uh, well, that's a years old joke that I, I borrowed from another company. The other answer is at the moment 25 odd okay. and some of us mm -hmm. very odd forgive me for a little bit of humor it's difficult to say exactly i think we may have as many as 30 people on the books but some of those are part-time some of those although full-time are working remotely so it can be a little bit difficult to the numbers but there's usually yeah you know, when everyone's here there, there could be as many as 20 of us here so that's, um, that's the rough sort of numbers that we're talking about yes yeah, so it's okay great thank you and so to the freedom, I mean, it makes me wonder that because you have that freedom to decide which pro, you know, what to do, mm. how do you prioritize, you know, which project get the priority and how do you assess the risks and the opportunities of what you use to, um, to well, get yes, through I, managing this is, freedom? <laughs> yeah, that, that is a, a question, you see, because I'm not uh, out there getting the business in myself anymore. But uh, if I, again, a uh, bit of, bit of humour here, the way we decide is if someone asks for something, then we say yes. Uh, I try to instill the concept that for every one thing that we do, there's an infinity of others that we don't. Mm -hmm. So how do we pick the best ones? And I, I think it's, well, I've made my own mistakes there. I mean, so I don't want to be too critical of, of other things that have taken up a lot of time and money and, and, and so on. But it just so happens that we have a, a particular success story on our hands at the moment, which I, I'm not sure I can even quite tell anybody about it properly yet, because we're already making as many of these things as we, we can. But it's a wonderful fit into the sort of products that, that we, we do here. And that was because of you know, people getting out and talking to customers and, and, and so on. I would like to think, maybe I'm just deluding myself, that as a result of some of the things I've said in the past in, in respect of trying to make sure that we're targeting things better, I would like to think I might have made a bit of an impact there, but I don't know. But we certainly, yeah, <laughs> our horses are running very well at the moment, put it that way. So that's cool, but it, it is indeed a fundamental thing. Oh, another aspect, which I think is extremely important and difficult to, to get over to the people. I was just mentioning with our filter wheels, this 50 millimeter version, which has come from nowhere. That's because we had a possible application. I, I don't even know whether this particular thing will fly or, or not. But from my perspective, from my experience of developing the filter wheels, developing the optospin, the 25 millimeter filter wheel was a right pain, it was much harder than I thought. You know, all sorts of reasons, problems to solve, but we solved them. However, when we did the 32 millimeter version, just to remind you again where we, where we are here, see, yeah. The 32 millimeter version worked straight away. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure if I showed this before on an overhead, let's see, there we are little history of our filter wheel to, to read as I uh, waffle on. Um, but I knew from my experience with, with that, that we could almost certainly quickly directly scale up again to a 50 millimeter wheel. And that was going to be a much better uh, way if I was called in because someone had done a custom design to uh, suggest how we, we could make a 50 millimeter filter changer. But I say, ah, oh, wait a minute. No, you don't want to do it that way because we can so easily scale up this thing. But that's not necessarily immediately obvious to the people who haven't been so intimately involved in the, in the design of these things. So often with these things, yes, the big problem is the communication so that everyone knows what we can do, what we can't, what's difficult and what's not. But it's something that's very important to get right. And I, I, I'm very pleased to say that more recently, we seem to have been getting it rather very right. So is there some take home message from that, which you can share with people. How do you actually prioritize so that you, you say yes, but you say yes to the things that will give you the business success in the long term and say um, something else to the 
rest of the project that might distract you. <laughs> well, sometimes it, it's things that have appealed to us. Jez, especially our CEO, yeah, loves doing various things, and he tends to find things which uh, yeah he likes to do and which can also make a certain amount of money. But I think what I'm trying to say is that perhaps we we aren't as good as prioritizing things as we might be or ought to be or not. I, I really uh, don't quite know on that. But what I do know is that I'm forever trying to pull us around to choosing things that we can make in bigger quantities rather than just one-offs and so on. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that I've banged my head against that brick wall sufficiently hard enough that there are one or two dents in it. Yeah, the wall as well as my head, so to speak. But this is exactly right. I, I do think that we would be better off sometimes having more detailed discussion in respect of, do we do this for A, that for B, or something else for C? Those conversations don't so overtly happen, except in so far, I suppose, yes, if, if everyone is fully stretched, then any new thing is going to have to look relatively more attractive than uh, it, it might have been otherwise. So in that sense, I suppose it might work by a sort of rationing. But I'd love to be able to tell you that we all sit down and strategically decide, let's do this, this or this. But I don't think it really happens that way. And do you still apply the process that you used at the beginning, which was essential, and that is you develop things in piecemeal fashion where you know you get something even this, these days that's half done to a customer that pays you money you see does it fly and then you move on or you have um, moved on from this um, approach now that's uh, uh, again i think another question we, we don't want to do too much uh, propaganda but you might be able to see behind me especially if i, if I move to one side yeah image splitters so these are things that we, we got in, involved in quite a number of years ago, but it's all to do with cameras being expensive. And now, that, now that, of course, cameras are even bigger chip sizes than you might need for uh, re recording things. That's another aspect. It's all very well having multiple cameras looking at multiple images, but, but it can be a hassle to get all that data into a computer. So if you can get several images onto one camera, then that, as well as saving possibly camera real estate costs, does simplify data acquisition. So for some years, we've been making something that will take you know, two, two images side by side, or, or shall we say, take a, 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 what should have been a single image, and then by virtue of wavelength, polarization, or you know, whatever you name it, uh, you can then put two images side by side on a single camera. Once we knew how to do that, we introduced a version that uh, could do three side by side. And more recently, although it's been a bit more of a technical challenge to get right, but yeah, we are finally there, is a four-way splitter. Now, th these, this is something that's close to my heart because both the two and the four-way splitters are, are, are either my designs or have evolved from them. So, yeah. They're, and they're, when you produce these things, uh, you know, how large are your typical manufacturing rounds? Is it customer by customer basis, or do you batch produce things? This yeah, is another, in business, this is a very useful and important question. It's to do with economies of scale, both with optics and mechanical stuff because of the nature of how they're made. Yeah, lenses have to be ground sort of individually, but in batches, or with metalwork, yeah, CNC machining and, and, and so on. Then, if you were to draw a graph, which I can't, well, I suppose I could show with my hands or something, but yes, you've got a unit cost here, which is one, and then it sort of slowly slips down, very approximately up to a certain number, maybe a hundred or so. It's kind of square root relationships. So yeah, it means that uh, ten is maybe a unit cost instead of being a tenth. It's maybe a, like a third unit cost of uh, of mm. the one ops. This tails off. Once you get significantly into double figures, this does tail off. Mm. So it means that other companies can't undercut you by using the same processes mm. to make these things in hundreds. 
Whereas we, if we are making something, we only need to make a few for it to be cost competitive compared with anybody else doing a one-off. So that's that's a very handy thing, which I think we've somehow, uh, yeah. It's not that we planned it that way, but we've sort of worked out, oh, that's very handy. So often, I think with business, you, you're doing things and then you're seeing that certain things work and then you're asking why they work and you, you try and uh, you take the lesson from that and hone it up. But I, I, I wouldn't say that we necessarily quite worked that out uh, in advance. Perhaps if I'm, I'm trying to be reasonably fair, I think with how the business has gone, it's not just me learning this, but I think the other people who are involved in all this stuff begin to see the, the cost advantages of being able to get at least up into double figures compared with the smaller ones. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's good, but it's a good question. Um, I'll just jump to a different area just because it personally interests me. Um, so I know that you spend a lot of time doing pro bono work, educating sciences and courses. You you write for your blog, so anybody can look on the Canary Research website. There's a lot of entertaining and interesting stuff there. And yeah. These kind of activities are not directly business related. And what is the value for a business if you run education or outreach activities? Hmm. Um Again, I'm afraid my answer has to be a little bit mercenary uh, because, yeah, yeah, so actually it, it all comes into the same strand. I'm thinking of the, every year, apart from these COVID problems, we've gone first once and then twice a year to various workshops held at the Marine Labs in Plymouth. Now, the reason that's close to my heart is that when I was at, at Shell and they were beginning to do these things on the strength of my science work, I was invited to give a lecture at the uh, first of those things. And this was in I think, 1984. But then I, I couldn't participate anymore really until I was uh, full time with Ken, which was 1989. So I picked up the phone and said, uh, oh, I'm free to give that lecture again. To which the response was, why not give two or three lectures? Why not come for a few days? So I've ended up uh, being there every year since. And learning, it, it's a great environment because what we do is we bring equipment and use it in the lab. And that sounds like a lot of hard work, but of course people see it, and they, they, they know us and know them. So it can, for a smaller, tighter group, but people get to know you. And yeah, much as I, oh, well, I, I think we'd do it if it wasn't, entirely uh, yeah, cash free so to speak but it turns out to be a great great thing and it gives us ideas uh, more uh, exposure to uh, either present and future customers students and, mm -hmm. and so on so yeah I, it's it, it is all very uh, self uh, reinforcing we're also uh, doing some more local uh, involvements uh, as well in fact, I've got to be a naughty boy here because I've kept it under a lid uh, long enough. I've just become more officially involved in a local community radio station here, which is meant to be secret until Monday, but I doubt if uh, anyone watching this is going to <laughs> blag it out locally. Uh, but yes, yes, they seem to want me to be a regular presenter because of my particular whatever apologizes for a sense of humor. So the, uh, the little radio show I'll do will be called Cairn in the Community. And I think that's important as well, because Faversham is a lovely town where we are, but it's, uh, yeah. so there are other businesses like, like us, but I want to demystify what it is that, that we do and uh, help where well, we've, we've, we've taken on over the years various uh, local employees or people from yeah, Canterbury University, uh, just down the road and, and, and so on. So, so yes, to have these local connections is good uh, and it's fun and yes you mentioned my blogs which are often uh, often tongue-in-cheek but I'm, I'm in, intrigued by how many people actually seem to read them but there again it can be useful because if you're just passing by the someone and they're asking about the company and they want to know a little bit more about it then you can say yeah, have a look at the website with all the other stuff and if you want to know the the, the real ins and outs of what's going read read my uh, crazy crazy blogs so that's another fun thing to do. And I enjoy it anyway. I do a lot of things for fun. The trouble about, you know, to be honest, I would say 
one of the lessons of my life is that if you do things for fun, making money is automatic. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, that can be, can be, if you're doing things with a certain uh, yeah, commitment or yeah, whatever, enthusiasm. So we have got about 10 minutes or, or 12 minutes left and I think uh, I would not. I would not want to miss the opportunity to to get to how you moved from being a, a founder and CEO to a chairman, and you'll tell us about that. I'm sure happily. But before we um, we get there, I was wondering. You mentioned Faversham, and that's that's a rural town in Kent, and I find it kind of interesting because it's not. Um, it is maybe in commuter belt of London, but it is a rural place, and that I think comes with um, also some surprises because obviously you're not close to a, a, some um, academic hub. Um, you are not in a place where you will have natural graduates coming out um, of universities. And is that an advantage? I can see you have the advantage of perhaps uh, lower costs to run business, lower um, wages, but the hiring might be an issue. Um, how would you tell others? Is it a good idea to go to Boston, to go to Stanford, Cambridge, or is it actually perfectly fine to be in a rural place and run a, a high-end scientific business? Yeah. Faversham is very deceptive, actually. We're only about 10 minutes away from Canterbury, where there's a university. So the links there, yeah, we, we, if, if you redraw a city map, then we could almost be in the, the same, uh, sort of city in, in terms of that sort of proximity. So we're not really far away. Uh, it's, okay. Faversham's a relatively undiscovered place, actually. There's another place uh, called Whitstable, just down the coast, where you can buy tiny houses for truly enormous amounts of money because it's considered fashionable. If you go further into London, then in my view, the other places there are not really so attractive. Those shell labs were outside the next place uh, towards London, a place called Sittingbourne. I was living in one of the villages when I was there. If I'd known about Faversham sooner, I would have moved to Faversham straight away. Uh, but probably a chance while we're talking about this to pull up where we actually are based. Yeah, um, good, two good things. One is because we're not in some super dynamic business hub, then if people want to change jobs or get a job hop or any, anything like that, then if people want to do this sort of stuff in this part of the world, then, then they come to Ken. So that helps uh, with mm. a longevity. The other aspect is over the years, yeah, we've effectively become a real estate company as well as a business in, in terms of the, the land values that we have. This is a, a crazy thing. So that's a picture of our business now. Uh, the, the black building on the right with the solar panels is a relatively recent addition, the last few years. Uh, the other buildings were there before, so there's three buildings that have got uh, connected together. But the reason we could get somewhere that nice was because we found this farm. And that is the state of basically those premises when we bought. So there was an awful lot of work to do. And that was really something that I needed to do and organize. So once I was going into that, then we were basically uh, letting, I was having to let other people do more of the day-to-day -day running of, of the business. And then to add insult to injuries, we bought the farm in uh, 2001. Um, but the, uh, the, the land label blue here was stuff that was originally part of the farm and was uh, for sale in 2009. So we bought that because it seemed a good idea, it was available, and both of these things to give you the, the, the crazy thing is that the value of that land has gone up by a factor of five since we've been here. So uh, yeah, the, the land itself is worth close to a million dollars. And by the time we add on the cost of premises, again, we see we've built and improved the premises ourselves. So we have uh, yeah, a rather big uh, asset value there. So that's, yeah, that, that's a bit crazy. That's going to mean there'll be some, some time down the line, there'll be some tax implications about that, but we, we should be able to uh, deal with those. But it, it's also meant to see from this timeline thing I've just, uh, just put up, 
We built the farm in 01, moved in uh, 03, extra land in 09. And then having that as a particular site has then allowed us to, on the same site, put up an additional building and expand in situ, which has again, say, effectively saved us uh, a whole load of money. So, so yes, it's therefore also providing people with a very nice work environment. The main problem with Faversham at the moment is because of the commuting and so on, that the, the monies that we would pay, going rates, and maybe I'd like things a bit more than going rates, but people years ago used to be able to buy houses in town on those salaries. Sadly, mm. that's no longer really the case for most people. So they have to come in from further afield. That's the whole problem with the UK. Everyone you know, has to commute from somewhere else because they can't buy your premises or your houses uh, affordable where they work. But it's not, the uh, UK is not the only uh, place for that problem. So yeah, it's a bit frustrating, I think. So, okay, Martin, that's great. I will um, probably start finishing with the last question and that is um, when when you run a business as a entrepreneur who's going to be funded by investors by the time you're going to retire you probably not be in the company or you had some ceremonial role in that company but in your case you just told about these assets you have acquired and you have a business and maybe one day if you choose to retire what are you going to do and how can a person like you deal with that what are you going to what are your plans there well uh, yeah exactly well i tell people that i retired in 1989 which is uh, when i went uh, from you know, when i left shell um now I, I don't have any dependents so there's no one else really to pass things on to so uh, that's why uh, one of the reasons why the company and indeed sooner or later the entire farm will go into this trust um, now, what trust? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, employee-owned trust. So the whole whole shooting match. You see, because I basically own things outright here, then what do I do with them? This is a, mo a business model that's maybe not so well known, but some people do it. If you know the Guardian newspaper or uh, John Lewis uh, department stores or you know, whatever, they're effectively collectively owned by the employees. So uh, that gives a certain amount of future proofing in, in respect of uh, you know, no one can really so easily sell the company on. Uh, now, in respect of what I do, well, of course, I, I'm in this position where if I decide I don't want to come into work anymore one day, then I, I could do that. In, in fact, what's happening, I mean, I'm, oh dear, I'm not sure I'm really taking any more time off at, at the moment, but I do have a more relaxed view. And I'm doing, I, I enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy developing products and there's no point doing anything different. But in terms of having a, a life outside the business, yeah, then you're know, going to have a little bit of fun with this radio station and perhaps more important, not more importantly, but as an addition, having a 70 acre farm there's all sorts of things to do or organize or arrange around there so my life is actually a, a lot more varied than it, it might appear to be so why change it you know the future is now as i once explained to to someone who funnily enough i was having a conversation with someone in a pub talking about well, how one do life choices and a couple of years ago he started working for us hmm. And how did your employees and the people around you um, perceive this conversion or the planned conversion into the employee-owned uh, trust? And what does it mean for them? There would be some tax advantages, I suppose. But the most important thing is they don't have to worry what happens when Martin drops dead or goes off and do, do something else because there's a continuing framework. So things can continue here for as long as uh, as people want of course you have new people coming up new you know, new generations and so on and this it, we, you know we have a variety of people here in terms of their interests skills and abilities but we do have uh, several people who are uh, uh, clearly in our sights to uh, be the next generation of the more senior people and yeah, it's, it's a fun thing. I'm, I'm sorry I could say trite things. Let's say some trite things. There are people 
working for the company now who weren't even born when we started. I would like in the future for people to be working for care and who haven't been born yet. Sorry, that's trite, but why not? Why mm. not? Again, yeah. I hate this phrase thinking outside the box and so on, but this is one of the thoughts we can have because we're so independent. Sure. Well, thank you, Martin, for your uh, insights. And we'll try something new today. And that uh, several questions I'm going to ask you. And if you could quickly answer them in a few sentences. So looking back, which technology would you have liked to invent it? Oh, 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 that's very good. Uh, I, I wasn't quite good enough for patch clamping or fluorescent indicators. I'll tell you what appeals to me is the technologies which turn out to be really simple. Yeah, polymerase chain reaction, monoclonal antibodies. These were just crazy ideas that happened to work. I would, if, if I were well known for something, I'd much rather be well known for succeeding on a crazy idea than from uh, some great intellectual achievement. Who's your favorite scientist? Oh, oh Richard Feynman, probably. But I, I've also had a strong admiration for Roger Chen, sadly no longer with us either. Stephen Hawking was cool too, but there was something about Feynman. He was such a good communicator and being able to explain things in a much more straightforward way than many other people could. If you could choose to have a superpower, what would that be? To be able to instantly travel anywhere and see all the wonderful things in the universe. Yeah, to be able to somehow survive and yeah, looking at black holes, oh, you must even look at them or, or seeing all these things. I'm an arm armchair astronomer and all the mm. crazy stuff that's out there. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to at least somehow visit or experience all these places, which sadly, because of the speed of light, you, know, you, you can't do. We're, we're separated by millions, if not billions of years. And you know, by the time you get there, what you would have seen would have gone a long time ago. So it would have to be you know, something a bit more instantaneous than that. But yeah, that's what I would like to be able to do. And who would you like to hear interviewed in the innovation stories in the future? Oh, Andrew. <laughs> no, that's a very, another very interesting question, actually, one I hadn't really quite been prepared for. Um, one of the issues I have in, in respect to how the world is going, it would be good to try and get more younger people on. But of course, you don't know uh, it, who is actually going to succeed and who not. This is one of the problems we're going to have in the UK with, with Brexit, I think. We're going to make it supposedly easier for leading scientists to come in and work. But it's not the leading scientists you want, it's the upcoming people. Hmm. So how you spot those, I, I really don't know. So hmm. that, that's a toughie. I'm not sure I've answered that one properly. And the last one. What is the most important message that you'd like to give to young entrepreneurs, science entrepreneurs? Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I would say what has distinguished me in terms of getting where I am compared with uh, anything else, I would consider a, a, you know, a lot of people are a lot brighter than me. But yeah, I'm the guy who has got all this because I dared to have a go. And I think that's that's very important. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't worry about whether the glass is half full or half empty, because for me, it, the, the glass was getting uh, pretty empty when I was at Shell. But I thought, oh, time for a refill, time to uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that I'm not necessarily the most wanted person in the world and just quietly get on and uh, use that as an opportunity to do the things you really want. So yeah, yeah, be positive, be positive. The world's not for you, it's not against you. But on the other hand, yeah, if you uh, if you don't try, you won't get won't get anywhere, unless you have a rich daddy or something like that, which is would be absolutely horrible. That's it for today, okay. Martin. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for coming.